Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Christian Gohl, and um, I will talk about Werewolf, which is a installation tool for high-performance compute cluster. Yeah, yeah um, the thing what we are talking about, where the Werewolf name coming from, is from this Beowulf cluster. Beowulf itself, it's an old British poem, and um, then... And, the idea of a Beowulf cluster is simply was popular in the 90s, where people thought, okay, we can use off-the-shelf hardware to build supercomputers and not use a Cray with a special CPU, with a special Unix, but simply use um, X or at that time 4086 uh, um, compute nodes and um, use Linux on it. And then there needed to be a management tool, and this was Werewolf. The uh, Gregory Kutzner, who uh, wrote that stuff, did a typo. That's the reason why it's called so different. It's Werewolf. It should be a Werewolf, this thingy which goes up at night and eats people, but we are now Werewolf. And the positive thing about it's really google level because nobody else has this typo. It always goes back to this um, project. Also, the... Uh, Sendos has the same origin. It was also in this Chaos Linux project where they decided, okay, we need a Linux uh, or enterprise-ready Linux for running the cluster, but um, as we have several hundred cluster nodes, we don't want to have these licenses and pay the licenses for them because it's getting really expensive if you go to the wrong salesperson who doesn't understand HPC, then you say, yeah, I need 100 licenses, they will charge your lock, that's the reason why there's also Sandos. And it's still related, so Gregory Kotzner also started now this Verbal 4 project, which I'm now actively in. Now that's the thing. Um, the HPC landscape changed a bit during the years, and now Beowulf cluster are the standard. That's the top five at the moment. And um, as you see, I just took out the CPUs, um, the accelerators, and also the... Um, the the fast interconnect, and only this uh, Fugaku supercomputer in Japan does use its own custom CPUs. The other ones, they are a bit special, but for a compiler view, it's simply an Epic, it's simply in Xeon, and that's it. So you don't have to mangle with your software. Also, the GPUs are fairly common accelerators. They are just a bit bigger, have more memory, but they are basically using this, for example, the same NVIDIA driver. It's really nothing, no real specialization here. Um, yeah. Now, what's, that's one of the Beowulf thing I had. It's more or less a storage, but um, what are really the components you have in your server always? You always have a management node, and then you have the compute nodes. And that's all you really want, and then you, always have an explicit management network. You really need that, That and this is not a campus network. This is really, you know, this is a private network with just your nodes on it, and nobody else is there. And also, you always make sure that your nodes um, do network boot. I never see a, uh, saw a system where, there was the, where, where they really booted from disk. You always want to be able to have them to boot from the network. Um, and if you have more money for your Beowulf cluster, you simply buy more compute nodes. That's the thing they're always trying to do. And also, um, what's also always special, you have also a fast network, which is InfiniBand or anything else which are formed out of InfiniBand. Um, that also means that this fast network must be configured, and it's not, or mostly non-standard, so you don't have DHCP on it or anything else, so you have to configure them statically. Also, network manager does not always know how to configure this network, so you need kind of really special configuration options for this. And what's also most likely part in a Beowulf cluster, you have one central storage location where your data comes from and your applications come, come from, and most likely you will be able to remotely control them. So you also have uh, BMC um, in the system, and this is always configured. Um, there's a difference to the uh, to a data center that the compute nodes are really cattle. It's kind of, 
you don't have this is this cattle pet discussion, and a compute node is a compute node, and if it's dead, you reboot it, or if anything bad, you reboot it, and if it's still bad, you you simply send it back to the manufacturer and say, yeah, that's, that's a bad node, I want a new one, and they will send you a new one, and you install it, and that's it. You do not really care for them. Um, also, one important thing is that in opposite data center, you have these parallel applications. They run over several nodes, it could be several hundred nodes where one application runs from. And the application implicitly wants that every compute node looks exactly the same, with exactly the same software and with exactly the same hardware. If, you, if one CPU is different, your complete parallelness, parallelness will break and the job performance goes down. So this is really the need that Every node looks the same, also from the hardware from the hardware side and then from the software side, so from the kernel side, no difference should be here there. So you have a very, very hierarchical organization of a compute cluster because you know per se what you want on it. So you don't so at installation time when the nodes physically arrive, you, you prepare your golden image and then you freeze that and you never ever will change it again. That's at least how most of these uh, compute centers work. Um, also, the, you don't update the compute nodes with any software because if you would do that, there are two things why you do not want this because if one super call f would fail on a node, you would, have, you would be in an inconsistent state and that's what you don't like. And the other thing is if you have 200 compute nodes um, getting to a repo, every repo goes down because they all come exactly to the same time. They have a high-speed network connection. That's pretty bit, uh, most likely a deny out of service attack. For example, I once had one when I, I tested the internet connection of my compute nodes and did a ping in parallel from 200 nodes to Google. That was not a good idea. I was immediately blocked. Um, the block went away. I was quite happy with that because I was really that the complete institute would be without internet connection. Or, yeah. um, there's also another thing, the application itself, which run them, they are not part of the operating system. They are, kind of, they are self compiled, this is scientific software, and um, we could not even compile them for SUSE for them because they, they really turn on all optimizations which are possible. And if they have some CPU with AVX 512, they want every piece of the code have this enabled because this gives them the last percents for faster run. Um, this means the applications are also always self-compiled. They come from a central storage. So that means you, you don't update the OS but you update your applications, but they, this is a complete separate process. There are also special tools to do that in an automated way, which are here um, EasyBuild and also uh, Spark, where Spark is also part of uh, SLES. Yeah, okay, now what is Valve about? So we have these different components. So we have the compute nodes or the compute node image. This means they boot from network into a tempfs. We don't install anything on the nodes. Really boot completely into the memory. Um, and then we have one service on the management node, which delivers to the nodes the kernel image, the node image, and then the configuration. And um, as the kernel can have several init RDs, so you, you can stack them, we simply have the kernel, put the node image on it, put the modules on it, and the last layer is the configuration, the node-specific configuration. Um, Melv also has then a command line tool to manage all the stuff, and for the whole network boot, we need a DHCP, which is an external service at the moment where we can have configuration files for the IC DHCPD server, or we can also use DNS mask for that. We need TFTP for the first stage where we kind of um, get the IPixi or CRUB to the nodes. This guy works from, with TFTP, which comes from, we have configuration file for the one from kernel.org, which we simply put the files in the right direction, but you can also use DNS mask for that. And optionally, Werewolf, we can 
uh, configure some central NFS mounts, and also we manage the ETC hosts. So um, there's no really DNS management. But as soon as the hosts, are, uh, as soon as your compute nodes are an ETC host, you can run a DNS mask on it, and you are done. Now that's the central level of configuration. That's the difference between free and for. In free, there was always it has a backend for different databases. And that means if you have a backend for different databases, you have to worry about how do I make a backup of this database? How do I dump that database? And all this kind of stuff. So the way we are now going well for is we have one central YAML file. And this is the node database. And there are really, um, the main advantage is really um, you can do ECN backup, just copy it somewhere else. You can have a version control on it, the external one. You can simply pull, push it into a cheat repo, and you are done. And it's just one text file. And you can also um, manage it with an external tool. Simply fire up editor and edit your notes in there if you don't want to use the command line tools. Or we, I know that there are people using Ansible to create this YAML file. And also, the thing is, that the structure is really kind of simple. So I have an example. And um, you can imagine for node 2, it would be simply the only thing it really needs is its IP address and the MAC address. And if I would have more network, there would be just here another line which tells me, OK, there's another network, and all the rest is done. And so it's really understandable. And that's, that's if you want the, the people for adopting a tool, it's really you have to take care that they, ask, they understand what's going on. And the configuration file like this shows you, OK, that's all we have. Um, yeah, we also have here not just nodes in the database, but also profiles where you can then store, OK, uh, for things which look the same for every node, which is, for example, the device name, because we have the identical hardware, or, for example, the MTU, or all this kind of stuff then go, should go into a profile or what kind of um, container we boot. Now, this is then how we manage all this stuff. So there's now a comment for adding nodes, for setting the different values in the nodes. Also, and then how does it really look like, the configuration look like, because we have some things from the, uh, from the profile and other values come from the, from the node itself. And then you can immediately see, OK, I have superseded here the comment in have fun. The rest, the container name, came from the uh, from the profile, which is the default one, and then we we have other values we have to we have to be which have to be presetted. So they are also kind of same default values. For example, like the and it's not here the net mask, because we know okay it would be most likely this kind of net mask. So we just set it. We need it for this network configuration later, but it should be user visible. Um, now, that's the configuration, how we manage the configuration file. These are, they are based on the Go templating mechanism. A Go template is kind of, um, if you are more from the Python world, then it's, it's like a Jinsha template. So it's kind, it's, it's a really complex language where you, um, where you can create configuration files. Um, you could even call uh, Go functions inside templates when you export them in the right way from, from your Go function. So you can also say, OK, I will include another file and all other small file functions. Also, you can have loops, which you see here, and other things. And what we and then these templates are rendered by Werewolf, put into the overlay, and then they are in the, then this overlay is applied to the node. And here I also showed, this is now the, e the template for ETC issue, which is the thing you see when you log, uh, when you just booted up the node. And here I just added here, you can also have your own, or you, it's not um, that you have to rely on what we thought could be inside, but also um, you can have your own text uh, or key value database in. So here I show, okay, I simply said um, here, that the location should be Ostrava, and then the render template would show you, okay, greetings from Ostrava, because we are here in Ostrava. So that's 
what you would see the rent. So that's the issue then in uh, ETC issue then in the overlay and how it really looks like there. Um, yeah, that's also the comment for how to render it. Now, I talk now about the overlays. So we have kind of two kind of overlays where we, uh, overlay is always the, the, the the combination of all the templates or other static files we have in there, and we have kind of two possible overlays. That's one, the system overlay, and that's really important because it's applied to the image before we boot, so we can put all the pre-boot stuff in there we need. So we need some, um, Werewolf needs to do some bootstrapping, especially for SE Linux. Um, and we also put in there the static network configurations, for Wicked, for the network manager, and other legacy scripts for other distributions. This means um, that they can live in parallel. That's really possible. We also configure the NFS mounts and also the file system mounts. And then we have another um, overlay, the so-called runtime overlay, and that's updated on per default every minute or on a regular base. And this, the reason for this, I. We do this regular update that this can be secured in some way. Um, and then you have your own overlays, which you could um, put into the system overlays on the runtime overlays. So we really enable the user to configure the cluster themselves. Because every cluster is a bit different. They need some special scripts for their parallel file system, for their special network thingies, and all that kind of stuff. So we really need this tooling for them. So that's the more or less the security models we have right now, the security, how we think about security in a cluster environment. We say always, we assume the cluster network is safe. So nobody else is on that network. It's completely separated from the internet. It's always internal. And with this all parallel file systems, you also have to, to there is the fact that if you got root on one node, you will immediately kind of mount other NFS mounts or kind of parallel file systems also don't have a real security inside. So if you are root on one node, you are root on all nodes. Um, so the only really security we have there in Valve that um, the, um, you can protect the node and the system overlay with the asset tag, which is in the BIOS and only root can read it out. So you cannot really go there as a user and download the other, this, the node image or the system overlay or the runtime overlay. Also the system overlay, uh, yeah, that's wrong, that's, it's the runtime overlay must be downloaded from a privileged port and only root is able to open a privileged port for download. Um, also one positive thing is it's really, um, you cannot really, install persistent malware there because we are in a formal, um, we are the, the installation just lives in the memory with reboot, you will get a new image and anything is um, bad, what could be in there is gone. Um, then one thing what's making Werewolf special is um, the way how we get the node images to the master host. So the thing is, um, you download complete OS images, and they are really stored in um, a OCI registry, which means we have for our product, we have in our registry a SLE 15 SP5 HPC image, and the OpenSUSE registry, we have a Tumbleweed image, and I think SP5 325, uh, leap six, uh, I think the repo is missing, but I will have to check that if it's building or not. It could be that it will be cut out of build. And on GitHub, there also there's again a leap image, also Rocky and um, a DBN one, I think. And the thing is, then um, it's really easy to download them. So if you want to switch distributions, you just download a new one, assign it to the new, boot it, and then you have a completely new OS on it. It's really as simple as that. Exactly, and you can also, we have a, a viability to shell into the, um, into the image that if 
the image does not contain all the necessary parts you want for most likely it's the Melano uh, it's the Melanox driver or the uh, or the Nvidia driver you simply shell into the image and then you can run a super in there and do your stuff there um, yeah and also what's now that's a bit missing that uh, we also do some bind mounting that the auto registration so if you register if you run it, it on a um, SLE node um, then you will also get the same registration um, credit or registration credentials inside the, the image um, that's also now new for SP6 so it's this is level 45 there we also then introduced the possibility of disk management we are completely doing it not um, with Valve itself, Valve just provides the configuration. The real disk uh, thing is then we just call ignition. Um, we have our, there is then um, a system D service which calls then ignition and ignition does all the rest. That's pretty cool and it's really working. At least I know from debug reports that people found things out there and asked questions on the Slack channel and saying, okay, how do I do this? How do I do that? Um, yeah. Then this is the boot process, how we boot. This is the legacy one or the, uh, well, the actual one. So the thing is we have the network boot. Then um, the first thing which it's getting, it's the IPixie binary. Then the IPixie binary um, then goes over to HTTP and then we can give the node its specific config so that it knows, okay, which kernel I need, which node image I need, and which are my overlay of S. And that's only working with HTTP because only with HTTP this goes to the valve of D server and this one then knows the node. With TFTP we simply don't know which node it is. We simply give it something out. Exactly. And this is now new, that was implementation of mine, that we then go, okay, if we boot with Grub, we have secure boot. And that's really, um, it's impressive to have, it's a checkpoint thingy more or less, but at least we can do it. Um, we extract, if we have the normal boot process and we boot over TFTP, we extract the um, shim from the host operating system and the grub also because this phase um, runs still per TFTP, so we don't know which node we have, and when we don't know which node we have, we don't know which image image it wants. So that's the thing. So we get the shim, the grub, and then the rest goes um, then in the right way. The thing here we have secure boot enabled and possible if the Control server has simply from is from the same vendor as then your compute image, and now if you switch your compute nodes from um, the normal TFTP boot to HTTP boot, we can know earlier um, what it really wants and what OS it is. So we have here a gross cross product, cross product secure boot. So if we would have a customer with Liberty Linux, this would also work, because then we can. We know at, it, uh, at this early stage, okay, this node needs, um, uh, needs that shim. And then we can extract the shim from the container, send it over to the node, and then the shim gets the right uh, drop, and then all uh, things work uh, well, uh, work as expected. But this must be configured in a BIOS. This is more really a hardware thing from the hardware vendors, but most BIOSes their first step is going per TFTP. Yeah, and then now again the the whole project. This is um, so it's part of sleeve since SP5. Um, we now have a SP5 containers since some weeks. Um, there is a very active upstream community around it. Um, uh, Revolve itself will be. Uh, or, we are in the process in getting it in the, as a Rocky Linux Foundation project. Um, and most likely most people, or the development comes from us or from me, my side. Also CIQ, that's the guys behind Rocky Linux are doing a lot of stuff there. 
that's it. And there's also um, in the community meeting, we also always have um, a rep representative from Intel or from OpenHPC. That is, is, it will also will be part of OpenHPC. So, thank you for your attention. That's all. Are there <laughs> other questions? Or questions? Egbert. Yeah, could, could you give some uh, uh, idea on what's still in the queue? Because uh, we actually had some plans yeah. for SP6, which we didn't realize, but they're in the queue upstream now, so maybe you want yeah, to Yeah, in the queue upstream now, and that's always a feature which all people, when they hear about Valve, they always say, yeah, I want, we want persistent install. That's the, I don't know why they really want it, because you have a fast network, your image is really small, you can, so it's working without persistent install, but that's on the queue that we at least enable it. And it's more or less, I think, a checkpoint thing because you really don't need it. Even if you have your image in the, um, in the memory and you have a swap device enabled, it will get swapped out if there's memory pressure. So there's really no need for that, but that's on the implementation also bit better container management, also that a container could be updated in a more or in a better way. I, I was a bit late to the talk, so yeah. maybe I've missed it, but did you actually talk about scheduling, like Slurm or something? No, no, that's a completely different thing. It's kind of Slurm then runs on top of this. Okay. Any plans to support other architectures? Like hmm? Any plans to support other architectures? ARM is supported. We have ARM builds. Uh, there are some things that... The, the only thing which doesn't work, if you have an ARM image on an x86 machine, you can shell into it. So you would have to manage it in another way, but that's working, and you have to... but. For example, the IPXC binaries, you just have them then for ARM, but it's working. We tested that. So there's an open QA test which runs on ARM. Okay. Thank you again.